Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges, and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. And hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Scott Luton here with you on Supply Chain Now. We've got an excellent show teed up here today. We have a timely topic uh, that many supply chain leaders are trying to effectively address to deliver results, sustainability. So folks, when sustainability comes up in your supply chain discussions, do the conversation or does the conversation always seem to touch on the same tired, non-productive, old topics and solutions? Hey, join the crowd. Today, we're going to be breaking through all that noise and get beyond all the oversimplified cliche answers to sustainability solutions and approaches. We're going to be focusing on approaches and solutions that work. Imagine that. We will also be talking about how you can turn sustainability into a cost-saving strategy while lowering payback periods and achieving top EcoVitus scores. So we're going to be talking about all of this and a whole bunch more as I'm joined by a couple of business leaders out there making it happen in the industry. Okay, big show teed up. Let me bring in our esteemed panelists here today, starting with Cheered Villon, partner with Spark360, and his colleague, Evan Yonker, Chief Growth Officer with Spark360. Hey, hey, Evan, how you doing? Hey, doing good, Scott. How are you? Wonderful. Great to see you again. And Cheered, how you doing today? Doing well, Scott. Doing well. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I'm really looking forward to getting into our conversation here today. Very timely, relevant, and I think uh, there's a lot of inquiring minds looking for a better way when it comes to sustainability. But before we get there, right, before we get there, I got two warm-up questions for each of y'all. We've been doing our homework here a bit. So, Sheard, we hear that you are as passionate about biking as you are about supply chain performance. So if you would, tell us about your daily routine, which may include some 10 hours a week, 30 to 35 miles bike a day. Is this your standard pace, Cheered? Probably it is, yeah. Clearly living up to the Dutch stereotype, I guess. But it, <laughs> uh, joking aside, it keeps me mentally and physically fit, I guess. And uh, yeah, yeah, I just like riding my bike. And before work starts, put some miles in it. That's what I like to do. Uh, I think that's a song, too. I can't remember the group is saying it. I like to ride my bike. Uh, at, 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 that's Queen, right? should... Bicycle Race. That's what it is, dude. Right. Thank you. <laughs> so I, hopefully folks can move on from my very poor queen uh, pseudo performance uh, and uh, get to a music trivia question. But anyway, I digress. Cheered. we're going to be doing some biking benchmarking maybe when we reconnect next time. But twitching from biking to baseball, Evan, you're a fellow Atlanta Braves fan. You know, they just squeaked into the playoffs yesterday. First playoff game is tonight. What is your yeah. favorite Atlanta Braves player of all time. 100% Chipper Jones. 100%. Grew up worshiping the guy. You know, he ended with, uh, what, over 300 career batting average, 500 slugging percentage, and and just a really nice guy. So he will always be my favorite baseball player. I'm with you. I'm with you. It's such a legendary, consistent career. Of course, a Hall of Famer, too. So good stuff there. You took me back a few years. Uh, with Cheered and Evan, we got to get from sports to supply chain, sustainability, and a whole bunch more. So, Cheer, let's start with you and, and uh, get you to tell us about your background, which includes Nike, Converse, and many others, and something I didn't know about those two organizations. Tell us about yourself. Yeah, it started with, I guess, 15 years with different 3PLs, you know, going through the ranks, starting with engineering projects, account management, and site management. And then, yes, I had a chance to swap. Uh, to the other side of the table, and I spent about eight years with Converse, owned by Nike. Uh, something you didn't know, but probably many people do not. First in uh, in Europe as the distribution director for about five years, and then I had a chance of moving to the headquarters in Boston and work on supply chain strategy there, mainly on sourcing and manufacturing and some omnichannel work. And now I'm with Spark 360 for the last two years, you know, trying to bring whatever experience I have to customers and uh, delivering change and results for them. Love it. Uh, and omni-channel is a very relevant word. You've got a very holistic background, and I can't wait 
for all of us to learn from your leadership, your experience, your expertise here today. And as you point out, I had no idea. Maybe I'm the only person in the world. I didn't know Nike and Converse were actually part of the same family. Uh, all right. So Evan, if you would, uh, great to have members of the Spark 360 team back with us. We've had a great podcast. We had a great session on some research we'll touch on here in a minute. But tell us if you would remind a few about what Spark 360 does. Yeah, well, Spark 360 has been called kind of the hands-on consultants, and and I think we're a little bit offended by that, not by the hands-on part, but by the consultants part, because pretty much our team is made up of people like Tier, people with real-world experience. You know, we've had supply chain managers and operators at all levels of uh, supply chain and logistics in the sustainability world, and uh, we came together to deliver, you know, first-class uh, real-world solutions for companies that are facing sustainability and supply chain challenges. Love it. Uh, real world, practical, tangible, none of the, the highfalutin conceptual stuff. I love that element of y'all's DNA there at Spark 360. All right. So Evan, it's here. We got a lot to get to your day. So our topic, as we have been talking about sustainability solutions that work, looking beyond the oversimplified answers. And there's lots of oversimplified answers, not just relegated to sustainability. Okay, so as we were talking a second ago, uh, when Evan was telling us about Spark 360, it's important and relevant to note that Spark 360 is different than a lot of those other consulting firms, hands-on, boots on the ground, tied directly to real results. That's really important to note here. So when it comes to driving real sustainability outcomes, there's a ton of different approaches, successful, unsuccessful, counterproductive even. So Evan, let's start with you as we continue to set the table a bit. What are you seeing out in the marketplace? Well, and, and Scott, we talked about it last time we were together. We hear things, you know, when we're talking to clients, we're talking to potential clients and people we work with. And last year we decided, or earlier this year, we decided to go out and actually talk to about 300 supply chain managers across the United States. And we did a, a fairly extensive survey. We did where we discussed it in depth, but- yep. We learned a few things about, about sustainability and how people are, are approaching that and what they're seeing in the market. One of those is that over 93% of supply chain managers are reporting that they're seeing sustainability requirements in RFPs. And with more than one third of those saying that they're seeing it often or always. And that was a little bit higher than we'd expected, but it's certainly it's something that's continuing to grow. At the same time, 21.8% of companies reported that they have either, either a non-existent or only slightly comprehensive sustainability program. So we're seeing this demand for something that we're not able to provide. And so that's a little bit off in terms of where we need to be. Another thing we noticed is that about 50%, just a hair over 50% of companies are measuring greenhouse gases. And 10% of the supply chain managers didn't even know if they were measuring them or not. And so you can take kind of that 21.8% number and that, that only 50% measuring number, and you kind of see where we are in the U.S. in terms of our sustainability programming. And we also see that higher demand. On the flip side, or on the promising side, I would say, is we're seeing a lot of people beginning to collaborate on it. And so both on, on supply chain uh, initiatives, but also on sustainability initiatives, you have a little over 70% that are sometimes or often collaborating with their suppliers on initiatives. So there is some encouraging news coming out, but we are definitely seeing a huge growing edge. You know, those are just a few of the things that we've learned in the last year from this survey. It's interesting, Evan, as you uh, lay this out, high demand, almost all RFPs almost are at looking for sustainability inputs and results. And then the other flip, other side of the coin, the majority of organizations have either a really new approach to sustainability or it's not existent. So there's a massive opportunity out there for sure. I don't want to switch gears. Now that Evan kind of set the table a bit, cheered and shared those key takeaways from supply chain leaders, 300 of them from across the industry. I want to gain your insights as to what you're seeing on the ground. But I want to start with this. How do you view sustainability in a broader sense, Chir? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think you, you hit on it, right? But many companies, many people, they look at sustainability and they, 
see it as an obligation or something that's for the future or it's nice to have. And definitely it's something that costs money. Whereas for me, as how I see it, and also when I'm speaking to companies and customers, more and more companies and customers take this really serious, right? We have, we have an example where companies are being taken off the RFQ list because they're just lacking a proper sustainability strategy or a roadmap. So it's very clear if you take this serious and you put an effort into it, and that's, that's very important, putting an effort into it, it will have a positive impact on your bottom line. I read an article the other day, and, and there it, they said it really well. It's not about the intent, but it's about the execution. And when you ask, what is it for me? That's where I'm passionate about it, where, where helping companies to have that positive impact to the world and improve their business results. Yeah, really important. We all know what intent uh, gets us, right? A best of intentions, hey, very admirable. But to your point, Sheard, it's about the ability to execute and show results. That's what those RFPs are looking for. And if you want to find more and more opportunities of finding new revenue, new good revenue, man, one of the best things you can do is strengthen your approach of driving real sustainability uh, gains because it is quite, this era is certainly um, full of the sustainability imperative is what I like to call it. Um, all right, so Chirid, when you think about all the elements required to assemble a sustainability approach that works and produces real results, right? And the ability to execute, as you just said a minute ago, what are those elements and why is it such a heavy burden for business leaders, you think? Maybe start with the burden. It's unknown. Many people see it as complex and, and costly, right? But also, uh, I think many organizations have sustainability, the same sustainability function in different departments. Some have it under legal because they focus on the compliance portion or under finance because it's related to accounting or under sustainability. But what's clear is if you want to take this serious and do something about it, you need cross-functional leadership alignment. And that takes time and coordination at different levels of the organization. So I think that addresses what is the burden and now what are the elements that are required? I think it really starts with an alignment at the organization, at leadership level. The executive team needs to be aware and needs to approve to do it well, because there's not a single executive leadership team member that will say, no, we shouldn't do this, but we understand what it means to do it well, right? So that. That is very important. That's the base, I'd say. And then you get into the approach and the process where you need to understand what is important for my organization, for my company. For those in Europe, you know, there's uh, this CSRD program. We're talking about material topics, but what are the main themes? What are important things for your organization? If you are aware of that, you're, uh, then the next step is to set a baseline. Understand where are you? What is your current emissions? What policies do you have in place? And so on. To then create a strategy and a roadmap for those topics, for those themes, and set targets for it. So measure it, uh, measure first your baseline, define where you want to go, and create a roadmap where you're going. And then have a cross-functional team, and that cross-functional is really important. It cannot just be that one team within the organization. It really needs to be cross-functional to work on those efforts. And that's when the fun starts, right? You'll learn, you'll fail, but you'll also succeed. So measure your progress and celebrate our successes. And those are really, I think, the, the key elements to make a difference. I'm glad we're recording this because the last five minutes, Evan certainly shares a great, uh, some proven tips, right? And what, some of the things we heard there, cross-functional leadership, it might sound easier. Well, it definitely sounds easier said than done, right? It takes time. You got to communicate, right? You've got to grab that alignment that Cheer talked about. You got to answer the question, the why? Right, everyone needs to understand the why. Why are we doing this? Setting the baseline, uh, reporting. A lot of studies out there. Organizations that don't really invest in the ability to report, they tend to have less success. All right, so understanding where you are, setting those targets, and then of course building the roadmap from here to there. Right. Quick comment, Evan. I'll think around before I continue with Chair. When you think of alignment, you think of addressing the why. You think of um, of really understanding and knowing where we are and where we want to go. Many of these are, are timeless, proven leadership, best practices. Your quick uh, check-in and comment there. Cleared spot on. It's really that inner, that multidisciplinary approach is, is what tends to yield the best results. When we try to silo sustainability as a checklist, 
when we try to take sustainability and say, okay, so-and-so, you know, the CEO said we have to do this, or so-and-so said we have to do this, or, oh, darn, you know, we keep getting an RFPs, we have to do it. So you make some poor guy go off and create a quick sustainability program thinking that that's going to solve your problems. Yes. It's not. And then you're going to be one of the people that's cursing sustainability. <laughs> It's, you know, sustainability is an opportunity to, to become more efficient, to, to create a system where you can, you know, optimize your supply chain while implementing a sustainability program and achieving best in class solutions. You can gain competitive advantage if you approach it from an integrated standpoint. Well, I appreciate you spiking the football on that because that's exactly where I'm going next with Cheered. Clearly core to y'all's philosophy and sure even your personal philosophy in terms of the results y'all have gotten is baking sustainability, just like heaven said, baking sustainability into everyday supply chain management, not as a separate function or a silo or initiative or project. It's core to really the DNA of an organization. That's how, that's what the best in class performers are doing. So all of that is one critical component to ensuring return on investment, which is important is successful, real results are there. And those payback periods, we don't want seven-year payback periods. We want them nice and short, right? Is all that right, Chair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So then if, I, um, if I'm following both you and, and Evan, is what emerges from all of that is a three-pronged simultaneous strategy that focus on, focuses on sustainability, supply chain optimization, and this word resilience that we've heard tons about, but we're going to talk about my hunch is real tangible resilience. So talk, talk to us about that three-pronged approach, Jerry. So if you think about it, right, if you want to optimize your uh, supply chain, you need to clearly understand all the players and the partners that you have in your network. And not just your logistics partners, but your think of your tier one, tier two, tier three vendors, for example, your logistics partners. So if you want to optimize that, you need to understand what's going on. Well, for sustainability, you, you need to speak to the exact same people because you need to get a lot of data out of your, out of your vendors in the value chain. Uh, you need to work with these guys to get that information. So you really need to speak to them, not just send an email and try to get the information back. Mm -hmm. And when you're thinking about supply chain resilience, you need to speak to the same people. So that's where that philosophy is coming from, where if you do this and you do this well, and not just in a one-off effort, but you build a relationship with these, uh, with these companies, you understand where each other's constraints are, you can truly optimize the supply chain for the better, optimize your costs, get the information that you need for your um, sustainability obligations that you're having, and then under also understand where your weaknesses are in your supply chain and do something about it. So that's where those three topics of sustainability, supply chain, cost or optimization, if you will, and resilience are coming together really nice. Yep. And they can feed each other there. Those three things, when we're really uh, set out to very intentionally with uh, great discipline and investment to optimize those three things, Man, it's like a flywheel effect can take place, I think, especially going back to your earlier response, but both of y'all were saying, when you get the organization bought in and committed to, hey, this is where we are, let's face the truth, going back to even Evan's uh, the survey numbers, right? A lot of organizations are struggling with sustainability, right? But let's, let's embrace where we are, and hey, here's where we're going to go. Here's a bold new target, and even better yet, this is how we're all going to get there. Uh, and then those three things, man can work like flywheels and across the ecosystem. Um, Evan, what else would you add as, as Chirin was talking about that three prong approach and the opportunity that's there, what else would you add there? I think that that's all spot on. Uh, the, the one thing I'll, I'll go back to the study on one other thing that we saw in payback periods, and I think it underlies this crisis in, in terms of how we think about sustainability, only or less than 15% of uh, supply chain managers believe they could achieve a payback period under one year for sustainability initiatives. Uh, now, we often work with clients and we're able to achieve payback periods within 120 days a lot of times, uh, but certainly a year is not, not out of the question. If you're looking at buying a, a fleet of electric trucks, that's a whole different ballgame, but there's ways to implement sustainability programs where you integrate it and you can achieve accelerated payback periods. 
But what really alarmed me was about half of the, the survey respondents believe that it was five to six years or never. Like you're, you're getting a quarter of the people in that five to six years, never. And then and another quarter are in the, you know, three, four years way up there. So, you know, it, it goes to what Tiered is saying. You know, if you have this integrated approach, if you if you look at it through that resilience and sustainability and optimization, if you look at it all together, you can come up with ways of, of really outperforming your competition because if that's where they are, you can do better. No doubt. Uh, and how many CFOs love hearing that the payback period is never Evan and cheered. Not many, <laughs> not many. Yeah, you don't win many fans with that argument. No, goodness gracious. But I want to go back to costs. You know, we were talking about reducing the payback period just a moment ago. So cheered, if you would share a few of the ways as to how business leaders can bring costs into check, because when they can do that, if you can really manage the budgetary investment of real sustainability solutions at work, that's one win. But then we know, as we talked about earlier, the second win is the revenue, new revenue we can reach by having a more sustainable organization. You can win twice as much. But let's talk about cost controls. Sure, what's, um, what's some ways business leaders can really make sure that they're controlling the costs of their sustainability initiatives? Yeah, it's it's contra contra well, it's controlling the cost, absolutely. That's all, uh, hey. You heard me try to, you heard me butcher a Queen song earlier. So it's okay, cheers. But, it's but okay. I, I recognized it, right? We didn't even practice that. I recognize it. So you did well. Um, recognizing uh, our controlling cost, absolutely true. But it's, I mean, we see this and uh, with it spark and I see it. I read this recent study of the Boston Consultancy Group. And okay. there they shared some very interesting insights. And, um, but one key line there uh, is when implemented well. And I put an exclamation mark on it there because that's what it is all about. If you implement a sustainability and you, you're only focusing on the compliance component of it and that you're able to generate a report and so on, it, it's not really going to bring you anything. But if you dive into it and work on uh, setting those targets, as we spoke about before, that's when you are able to, to earn back the, the money of the initial investment, right? Because Yes, you need to spend time and energy and resources into getting started. So that there's always first a cost component that comes first. But then again, when implemented well, you're going to be able to reduce your operational costs, like less transportation movements, less empty miles, different modes of transport, less waste, things like that. But also, and I, I think I hinted on it a little bit before, setting uh, targets and measure it properly. Because if you measure along the way and you see what you're doing, even if the results are not what you expected, you learn from it, you're focused. And that's uh, one of the things that will get your investments back. So that's really one element. And then the good news on it, because it, that sounds complex and like, oh, wow, this is a lot. But I think companies can achieve 40 to 50% reduction in logistics emissions using solutions that are available today. That's not just Cheer who shares that, but that's in the McKinsey study that was published a little earlier this year. Think of network redesign, routing or load optimizations, or vehicle efficiency, electrification, and so on and so on. So the solutions are there, but you have to be very focused on what you're doing and what you want to achieve and let it manage and measure along the way. Yep. A couple of points there I want to follow up. Uh, implementation whether it is sustainability, whether it's continuous improvement, whether it's all, all sorts of different things, inside supply chain management, outside. So many organizations struggle with implementation, right? Uh, they can gather and wrap their head around best practices and what they should do, but implementation is really going back to execution, not intents uh, and intentions, but execution. That's where a lot of folks look to reach outside the organization to find help. And of course, that's what Evan and Cheered and Spark 360 team does all the time. Uh, secondly, I'll go back to this BCG study. It's the fourth annual survey on carbon emissions. They surveyed some 2,000 companies. The rate of decarbonization has actually slowed. Only 11% of companies are meeting their emissions reductions goals. That's what Chair was talking about. You're setting those targets. But the good news is, and there's always good news if you go look, and financial benefits have continued to grow uh, from initiatives tied to getting tangible gains in your sustainability initiatives. Reporting, though, continues to be a challenge. Only 9% of companies 
said they comprehensively report scope one, two, and three emissions. But if you don't even report, things get a lot more challenging, right? It gets a lot more challenging to set any right targets and certainly from building a roadmap that will work, right? Oven. So you get calls all the time from your rock and roll network around the world, the market, customers, prospects, industry movers and shakers. But a lot of those, as we were talking about pre-show, uh, a lot of those are inquiries related to ecovatis frustrations. Now, for some folks out there, that might be a new name. There's some folks out there aren't familiar with that. So Ecovatis is having a pretty big impact on the industry. So first off, Evan, if you would, tell us more about what it is first. Ecovatis has been around for, for a little while now, and it's it's global. People all over the world are, are looking at Ecovatis as kind of a validation for, for some of their work. Uh, a lot of these RFQs are asking for an Ecovatis score, or if they're not, Ecovatis is a proxy for showing that you have a sustainability program. That said, particularly for companies in the, in the U.S., it becomes a proxy for 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 regulation, right? We've talked before, Scott, about you know the the regulatory environment in the United States versus the rest of the world, and you know the SEC passed right you know rule reporting rules, and those got taken to court, and who knows where we're going to end up, right? But at the end of the day, we operate in a global environment. We all know that, right? And so we have companies all over the world that have global reporting regulations in Europe and Asia and Australia. And if you're operating and working for any of these clients, you are getting, whether you want to or not, you're getting pulled into this conversation. Now, I was encouraged in the survey. It showed, you know, we listed a number of different reasons why people are interested in sustainability programs and all six of them showed that people were positively inclined to everything from talent recruitment to having an impact to to meeting regulatory requirements and everything else. People understand that larger impact. But when you're told, and, and we've had it, we've had people call, they have a, a global client and they're like, I don't need that stuff. I'm, I'm fine. And then the next week they get, hey, by the way, you have to have some sustainability program we're dropping you. And it's their biggest client, Scott. <laughs> so all of a sudden this becomes an imperative. And a lot of times Ecovatis and getting an Ecovatis certification becomes the pathway for proving that you have the programs. And so that has taken the place for many companies in, in place of regulation. So hey, Evan, that's an excellent point. If I could chime in just for a second, that third party yeah. validation is critical. There's no shortage of reindeer games going on, not just in sustainability, but across all sorts of reporting. And yeah. that's where I think Ecovatis and groups like that uh, mm -hmm. are really helping to demystify what's going on across the sustainability world, for lack of a better word. So that's a great call out, Evan. So please continue. So here we go. And, and so some people are calling us, we need a sustainability program or we're going to lose our biggest client. And some people are calling us, we already started an EcoVadis and sent in our paperwork and we did all this work. I had one guy call me and say, I invested, you know, we invested a quarter million dollars in, in a sustainability program to get an EcoVadis score and we got a horrible score. Wow. And they don't understand why. Just to let you know, Spark360, we, you know, we are a certified training partner and consultant with Ecovatis. So that being said, we can tell you that there isn't some magic proof. There's no random dice being thrown in the back room. There are a set of things that you can do to maximize your score. Okay. There's four categories and, and those categories line up with uh, the 21 sustainability criteria. And they all consolidate to that score out of 100. Okay. But I would say if I was to give your audience a, a list of the top do's and don'ts, the top don't is create your tracking reports in Microsoft Excel. This is not considered a, a management system. Microsoft Excel is not the heart of your sustainability program. And you'd be surprised how many people that's how they're tracking and, and reporting. Uh, what Ecovatis likes to see on the do side of this is management systems in place. And that's kind of a, a set of comprehensive policies, a set of continuous improvements that can be made by monitoring performance with tracking tools and relevant KPIs. And so if you put that in place, instead of Excel spreadsheets, you will be in a better position. Another thing, so number two. Okay. Don't, in doing an Ecovatis application, don't throw a bunch of stuff together just to get the application in and finish your application. 
One of the things that'll count against you is if those policies are less than three months old, that's a ding. Okay. And a lot of people don't realize that they think they're doing a great job by compiling things and getting them together. Right. They need to age. You're better off setting those policies and letting them sit for three months, implement <laughs> them, get used to them, measure against them, check on them, and then submit your application. Because if they see there's some age behind it, that will help out as well. There's a lot of these things. Now, like I said, we're, we're a certified training partner and consulting firm. So we'll help guide people through this process. But there's a lot of things like that that a lot of people aren't aware of that if you take those on, if you take that and, the, and you develop these systems, if you develop measurement, Tiered was talking earlier about, you know, you measure these things. If you start measuring, you start integrating it with your, your optimization uh, strategies, then you'll see real results and your Ecovada score will naturally go up. One other point I want to make is once you get a score, you're stuck with that score for a year. Okay, really? So if you don't have an Ecovada score and you're looking to get one, it's really worth taking the time to do it right. Because once you have it, that's what you have for the next year until you can reapply. So just keep that peace in mind. There's a lot of other things and we're going to have a blog post next week. So okay. if anybody follows us on LinkedIn, you can catch that post when it comes out, I believe next Tuesday. Those are some quick takeaways for Ecovada scores. Evan, I think that's gold. And I'm newer to Ecovats. Where my mind is going cheered and Evan is we get serious of that first step and really understanding where we are, right? And uh, set our targets, do our reporting, set the plan. And then we get serious about executing and implementing. And you made organizations out there, may, they may not have the talent in-house, right? Maybe they bring it in, but however they do it, they implement and get those results. And then thirdly, they look to leverage those results for those wins, but you got to do that the right way. As Evan's pointing out, you don't want to just pencil whip it to get it done because that may not produce the greatest score, which you're stuck with for a year. Right. And that that's a key point, Evan and Cheer, because if you're stuck with a certain score for a year, that may prevent you from optimizing the revenue and the RFPs and the gains you can make from your sustainability progress. Right. Am I following all that right, uh, Evan and Cheer? Right. I, I can be a slow learner sometimes, but is all that, am I tracking with y'all? All good. All good. Okay. All right. Wonderful. So now we're going to bring it all home. I'm all about examples and anecdotes, especially those with, with um, real practical elements to them, right? Let's do this because we want to, you know, we want to reduce costs. We want to speed up payback periods and we want to make sure we, we protect that valuable alignment, not just within uh, the organizational leadership, but the alignment with all the other corporate goals, right? Everything's got to play nicely in the sandbox, right? So when it comes to the examples, let's say I've got a company and I keep seeing, like we were saying earlier, Evan, I keep seeing those sustainability sections and RFQs and RFPs, and I know I got to do something. Otherwise we're losing competitive advantage, right? So how could I approach this in a way where I can successfully manage the money and time invested while still protecting and delighting my current customers? So what's a good example, Cheer, that comes to mind? There's many examples that I come up, can come up with, but one that I'm working on right now is for a company that has uh, manufacturing locations on both sides of the ocean in, in Europe and the US, and they're moving a lot of inventory in between those sites, mainly by air at the moment. And right now we're uh, working with them together to change the way that they plan and, and restock that inventory and shifting from air to ocean. It clearly saves costs and we all understand that. But think of all the emission reductions that they achieve at the same time. So I think that's just a very straightforward example of doing the right thing in terms of inventory positioning, being cost conscious and also reducing your emissions. Yeah, that's a very big example. Looking at smaller examples in a 3PL world, for example, think about packaging, right? We, we all put stuff in a box at, at some point for our customers and we're sending it out. Are the boxes right sized? What type of filling materials are we putting in there? Also there, it will have a big impact on costs. One box is maybe not that many, but we ship out all many boxes. The same with filling materials. So if you do that right, put time and attention to it. Different magnitudes, uh, but it works equally. Uh, I appreciate you sharing one of the cool things you're working on now. And of course, if anyone wants more examples, 
you can reach out to Cheered and Evan will we'll share with y'all how to do that in just a second. I want to call out two things before I come to Evan for your example. Packaging. I sure am grateful that the last couple of years, it seems like more and more consumers, practitioners, you name it, are paying more attention to packaging. Packaging is cool. It impacts your buying decisions, right? It protects the products coming to you. But now we're getting better and better at finding more efficient approaches to packaging, right? And making some gains there, sustainability and otherwise. Um, and then secondly, Evan, I'll go back. And you were sharing earlier about the do's and don'ts. And I forgot to call out one of my favorites, spreadsheets. Folks out there using spreadsheets for everything. They're setting their alarm with spreadsheets or using macros to cook but chicken dinner on Sundays. You know, folks have got to move on. There's better ways. There's better ways. So speaking of better ways, Evan, come back to examples. What's one of the examples that comes to your mind? Well, one of the things that that we've been able to support a lot of our 3PL clients with is it, it just basically looking at how you have your routes scheduled and, and, and reducing those backhaul miles, okay? So a lot of times things just get scheduled as they come in the door. As your client needs something, you know, you're going here with that and there with that. And you end up with a lot of wasted miles. I think 38% was the last number I looked at. And, you know, taking the effort and going through and figuring out what truck is going where on what day and how close that is to another client pick up over here on the other day, getting those things aligned, getting your capacity aligned with, with where you got to get things and trying to get those on a schedule that minimizes those backhaul miles, you're saving costs, you're meeting client needs. If you measure it, again, you got to measure it. If you measure it, you have the foundations for a great sustainability program and you're doing it all at the same time. You're actually creating a sustainability program based on something that's saving you cost anyway. So there's an example where integrating those things yields results. Love it. Love it. We have such a tremendous opportunity kind of along the lines of your sharing to eliminate uh, empty miles getting those empty miles off the road. Um, so I appreciate both of y'all sharing practical examples. It's kind of what you're known for, right? Uh, all about being practical. Evan, if I ever told you, I hadn't shared you, this with you, cheered, but I'm very well known for my practical approach to life. I gave Amanda <laughs> our first Valentine's Day together an umbrella because I saw her run in the rain one day. That did not go over <laughs> well, Evan and cheered. That did not go over well. And I'll I tell you, in the world of consulting, right? You want to be with a uh, practical outcome driven organization that can help you implement, right? I love the whiteboards filled of the best laid plans and all that stuff. And I want you in the trenches with me, helping to get the results that we're all after. And I think that's where a big part of y'all's value is. So now I want to make sure folks know how to connect with both of you, Cheered and Evan. So, uh, Evan, let's start with you. We're going to have to talk about Braves baseball. We'll see how they fare against the Padres tonight. Uh, love your Chipper Jones, uh, your passion for Chipper Jones, one of the best ever played a game. Uh, but, Evan, how can folks, beyond talking Braves baseball with you, if they want to lean into the cool things you are doing in industry, driving change, uh, helping organizations implement and, and uh, reach tangible goals, or they want to pick your brain on what you are talking about a second ago, Ecovatis and how organizations out there can leverage that effectively without using spreadsheets. How can folks connect with you, Evan? Yeah, well, uh, again, you're going to have to be really good at spelling because nothing <laughs> nothing is spelled like it sounds. But my email is evan.yunker at spark360.com. However, for those listening on audio only, that's E-V-A-N dot J-U-N-K-E-R at spark with a Q, S-P-A-R-Q, 360.com. And if you manage to get that entire email address correctly, I will definitely respond. And I will say, I will say, I, 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 we do put a lot of information out on LinkedIn. So if, if you're interested in a lot of these topics, I would encourage you to, to jump on LinkedIn and, and follow us or me, and I'll make sure you get that information as well. Outstanding. Um, Cheered. How can folks track you down and connect with you? You're doing some cool things. I, I bet uh, you've got a, a full plate, but I bet you welcome shop talk conversations from time to time, huh? Absolutely, absolutely. And if Evan thinks it's complicated to get his email address right, well, <laughs> sit back right now. So I have a very typical Dutch name with a freezing first name. So it's cheered.deyoung at spark360.com. I would just people encourage, you know, if you remember the spark360.com, just go to our website and, and you can find us there. 
Scott, if I can drop two more things really sure. quickly. One, uh, to your comment earlier about uh, uh, the number of uh, the holistic approach pieces, we do have data in that study we just did. But that study, we did talk about both the, those concepts, but also the familiarity gap. So if you're interested in knowing where people are in that understanding of those concepts and how to implement them and how that might vary by the size of company and so on, download the study because there's a lot of cool insights there. And I'd be happy to have a conversation with anybody if they're curious. You know, again, what 300 supply chain leaders, what their views are, that's like gold. And I'll tell you, Spark360 and Appalachian State University did a great job diving in. But Evan and Cheer, y'all have got colleagues at the CSCMP Edge Conference is taking place this week. Yep. Is that right, Evan? That is correct. Yeah. And if, if you message me on LinkedIn, I'll be happy to connect you. We got people there the next couple of days and, and happy to put you in touch. Outstanding. Great conference. Our early reports are that it is an outstanding conference. We look forward to getting some key takeaways from some of our friends there. I think it's in Nashville. Is that right? Correct. So, hey, if you're, if you're viewing this here from Nashville, all I got to say is go get you some hot chicken. Folks, whether you get it, uh, there's lots of different places. You got Prince's, you got uh, Hattie B's, you got other places, but man, it is delicious. Um, okay, what an outstanding conversation, Cheered and Evan. And I really appreciate how y'all approach this here today from practical, outcomes driven. How can we change from the tired, stayed, um, old fashioned conversations about some of the usual suspects when it comes to sustainability conversations to a bold new way of incorporating and baking it into the rest of your organization. And that way it doesn't just become a check the box today. It is how we do things as a business. So there's a lot more here. I wish we had Evan a couple more hours. Big thanks to you both. Big thanks uh, again, cheered the young partner with spark 360. Cheered, great to have you here today. Look forward to talking more of your shoe industry, sportswear industry uh, background, maybe a, in a later time. My pleasure, Scott. Thank you for having me. You bet. You bet. And always a pleasure, Evan Yonker, Chief Growth Officer with Spark360. Evan, we have some of the best conversations here today. Really enjoyed meeting you and Dr. Dave last time. And then you bring Cheered in here today, who's out there uh, moving mountains in industry. I'm waiting to see who you bring next, like the Rolling Stones or something, Evan? Yeah, yeah we'll see. It'll be a surprise. <laughs> all right. All right. Connect with Cheered and Evan, right? Again, if you're at CSCMP Edge this week, reach out to Evan on LinkedIn. You got to connect with the team there at uh, Spark360. That's at Edge. Let's take a different approach to doing something about the sustainability imperative. And with all that said, on behalf of the entire team, it's Pacha now. Scott Luton challenge you, do good, get forward. Be the change that's needed. We'll see you next time. Right back here at Sapache Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Supply Chain Now.